This series has been inspired by the book, Speak with the Earth and It Will Teach You, written by Reverend Daniel Cooperrider. In his book, Reverend Cooperrider shares that he was educated in the tradition of humans searching for God and meaning by way of turning toward the written word and sorting out contextual meaning. Then slowly, slowly, his Vermont church taught him that there was a different way of reading for God and meaning, showing him what it was like to read for God in the landscape and events of the earth. They taught him that the church was not just a place to read and interpret the written scriptures of God, but a place to read and interpret the expressions of God that emanate constantly from every corner of God's creation. This revelation inspired many of his sermons. Reverend Cooperrider divides his book into four sections, mountains, clouds, water, and trees. So we have chosen these themes as well. This Sunday, we begin by reflecting on the creation element of mountains. You have surely noticed our own representation in our sanctuary of a mountain, and we will continue adding creation elements each Sunday as we go through this series. I have one additional prayer concern from Zoom. Kathy Blessinger asks for prayers for her friend Sally, who passed away this week, and for her daughter, Sarah. Please rise in body or spirit for the call to worship. We gather this morning in awe of all creation, which reveals God's glory. We look to the mountains and raise our hearts and voices in worship. We come to the mountaintop to be covered in God's presence. We open ourselves to seeing and hearing God. We commit ourselves to serving our God of justice and peace. We hear the call to come down from the mountain and out into the world.
be seated. Our invocation this morning will be a bit of a departure from what is normally used. Amanda, on the staff here, has taken the beautiful pictures of mountains that many of you have contributed and created an inspiring prayer. Let us take a moment now to center our bodies, hearts, and minds so we can take in the words and images of her prayer video. Because of you, Creator God, the work of the valley becomes the glory on the mountain. All that labor for healing, the mourning with those who mourn, the prayers in the night that are mostly cries, the weary travels to the next person, place, or issue that needs our care, those moments when we sacrifice, when we're most vulnerable, when everything else is stripped away and the heaviness pulls us down while the chaff is blown aside. We are really on the high places, on holy ground, on thresholds of worship. We ask you, God, for the transformation that comes only from you. We ask you, God, for grace to see in a new light, to see you, to see ourselves, to see each other in a new light, to see the advantages that aid us and the problems that plague us in a new light. We ask you, God, to interrupt our plans to contain our epiphanies and call us to attention, to hear you still speaking, for we are listening. Our first reading from the book of Exodus tells us the story of Moses' encounter with God on Mount Horeb. Here, he receives his call to lead his people out of the enslavement they experience in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him, out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, 
and to bring them up out of the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, <coughs> to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Am Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. The word of God for the people of God. Our second reading is from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. Just before this reading, Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. His disciples don't want to hear it and want to deny its truth. This story of Jesus' ascent up a mountain with three of his disciples and his transfiguration takes place six days after Jesus' revelation about his death and shortly before his actual crucifixion and murder. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them with clothes that became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my child, the beloved. To this one you shall listen. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So when Vicki, Judy, and I talked about the possibility of a worship series on creation, I immediately said, I would like to preach on mountains. You see, my mother was born and raised in Switzerland, and she often told stories about her adventures in the Alps. Whenever we would travel to Switzerland to visit our relatives there, she reveled in being back among those mountains where she felt so at home. And she passed this love of mountains down to me. Not only am I in awe of their splendor, but I also relish the challenge of climbing to the peak, the exhilaration of reaching the summit, the wonder of the glorious vistas, and the rush of the descent down to base. That is perhaps why among all the elements of creation, I find, I find mountains the most majestic, the most entrancing, the most sacred. I am in awe of these magnificent formations that have sprung forth from the molten fire at the Earth's core. Their grandeur leaves me breathless and gives me a powerful sense of God's imminent presence. In our first reading, we heard about where Moses receives his first glimpse of God. This takes place at the foot of a mountain where a bush is burning 
yet not being consumed by the fire. Here is where Moses' life purpose is revealed to him. He has been called to set his people free, to bring the Israelites out of the bondage of Egypt and into the promised land. Moses obeys this calling, and later, after escaping from Egypt, he and his people come back to this holy ground, back to the base of this same mountain where they encamp for some months. Moses knows this place as sacred, and he goes up and down this mountain eight times during the period that the Israelites stay there. This mountain is where he encounters God, where he receives the tablets with the law, where he takes in God's glory. The second passage we heard tells the story of Jesus and the transfiguration. Just as Moses had his special mountain where he encountered God, Jesus does as well. He feels drawn to climbing his mountain, Mount Tabor, where he often goes to pray. This time he takes with him three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. If you've ever climbed a mountain, you probably know how exhausted you can get. Not only is it the physical exertion that can tire you, but also the change in altitude can mess with your ability to breathe and even to see or think quite clearly. So perhaps the pure magnificence of, so perhaps besides the pure magnificence of mountains, these physical changes one experiences also add to leaving one more open to an encounter with the divine. Mountaintops often become what are called thin places, not only where the air is thin, but also where that veil between the human and the transcendent, between this world and the world beyond, is very thin. These are places where the sacred can become more tangible and the divine presence felt more deeply. Upon reaching the summit, Jesus and his disciples are weary from the climb. Peter, James, and John fall asleep from the exhaustion, and when they awake, they are awestruck by the sight in front of them. There is Jesus talking with the ancient prophets Moses and Elijah, and he is glowing from the inside out. They hear God's voice speaking to them clearly. This is my beloved child. Listen to him. What an experience. God's light seen. God's presence felt, God's voice heard. Daniel Cooperider, in his book that I mentioned earlier, Speak with the Earth and It Will Teach You, talks about his experience on top of a mountain. He says that, on the top of my closest mountain here in Vermont, I have a practice of closing my eyes for a few minutes. In meditation, I let the thoughts of the day rise to consciousness and drift away on the ever-present wind on the summit. I try to forget for a moment everything I think I know about life and the world. I draw as close as I can to a place of still blankness, to the gracious void, the generative absence from which all things rise. And then I open my eyes. With a good dose of pristine amazement, the first thing I notice is the physical, material reality of the world. There's rock, there's sky, there's cloud and sun and field and a lake that shines with lapis lazuli tiles. There's all this muchness when there might just as well have been nothing. If I stick with this first feeling, I notice that I too am part of all this, mind, body, and spirit, and that body, mind, and spirit 
full being aliveness is pervasive everywhere and in everything that I see. Reality is a single interrelated blanket-like field. This is Reverend Cooper Ryder's mountaintop wisdom. What mountaintop wisdom did those disciples gain from their experience? Perhaps watching him shine like the sun, they finally see Jesus for who he really is, the incarnation of the light of God come to dwell among us humans on earth. Maybe they realize that he is the light for them, and not only for them, but for all people. Or could they possibly have taken in what Reverend Cooper Ryder calls Jesus's mountain wisdom? He says Jesus knew how to think like a mountain. He tapped into the ecological and ethical wisdom of the mountains when he preached the radical message to love your enemies. He said we should strive to relate to one another and to this world as God does. For me, just as the mountains offer a wide and broad panorama, so too does mountain wisdom call us to an expansive and far-reaching perspective. When I look around from a mountain peak, I can see far and wide, and I gain a sense of that interconnectedness that Reverend Daniel talks about, that Jesus preached about. I take in that unfathomable truth that we are not only one with creation, but also one with all that has been created, including all of humankind. I seek to open myself to the reality that we are all one, that the light of God that shines in me and in you truly does shine in every single person. The mystic Thomas Merton talks about having this revelation. He says, in Louisville, at the corner of Fourth and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all these people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness. I have the immense joy of being man, a member of a race in which God himself became incarnate. And if only everyone could realize this, but it cannot be explained. There is no way of telling people that they are all walking around, shining like the sun. Such revelations about our interconnectedness with the earth and with each other, about God loving us so much as to become human and dwell among us, about God's love shining in the heart of every human being, these epiphanies often come to us in what we might call mountaintop experiences. But like in the case of Thomas Merton, they do not necessarily happen on mountaintops. In fact, for most of us, especially living in Ohio, I would guess actually being on top of a mountain is probably a pretty rare occurrence. And we cannot orchestrate these experiences. They happen unexpectedly, almost as accidents. Any God sightings, any divine revelations are pure grace beyond our ability to control. But we, what we can do is spend time in spiritual practices such as prayer, meditation, mindful walking, yoga, worship, rituals. We can open ourselves to wonder, to gratitude, to seeing the world through a lens of love and compassion and unity. An ancient story gives us this insight. A rabbi taught that experiences of God can never be planned or achieved. They are spontaneous moments of grace, almost accidental, he said. 
his student asked, Rabbi, if God realization is just accidental, why do we work so hard at all these spiritual practices? The rabbi replied, to be as accident prone as possible. So we need times, places, and practices where we become accident prone, as it were, where we open ourselves to receiving wisdom and the affirmation that God is not only somewhere out there, but that God is around us and near us and actually dwells within us. And when these accidents do happen, when we have these experiences, these moments of a true sense of divine presence, of a revelation of divine wisdom, the temptation is to think like Peter and want to build tents, to stop time, and to stay in these blissful experiences and bask in their glow. But just like Moses, Jesus and his disciples came down from the mountain after their transcendent encounters, we are also called to come down. We seek times and places to be lifted up, to connect with God, to be filled with God's wisdom and light. But then we are summoned back down into a world where healing and hope and justice and love are so badly needed. God is with us in the brilliant highlights of our lives, in those extraordinary mountaintop experiences, but we must never forget that God is also with us in the ordinariness of the plain everyday moments and in the darkness of our valleys. Coming down the mountain, leaving a place where we feel close to God, where we've known God's light, is never an easy experience nor a welcome one. But even though these peak moments don't last forever, they do provide for us hope and energy and reassurance to keep us going. After Jesus and his disciples came down the mountain, they moved forward on the journey toward Jerusalem and the cross. But the moment of transfiguration was imprinted on their souls, giving them the strength to face what lay ahead. In our journeys, no matter where they lead, let us remember this. God came down into the world to dwell among us, to connect with us, to become one of us in Jesus, who was love, wisdom, light made flesh. Jesus came down from the mountain to teach us that we are all one, to love us into loving each other, to remind us that God's light shines in us all. And we, as followers of Jesus, are called to come down from our own mountain experiences to be a word of hope, a bearer of light, a healer in our broken world. May we always be open to encounters with God, to mountaintop experiences, and may they renew our spirits, giving us wisdom, passion, and courage to bring love, joy, peace, and light into our world. Amen.
dearest friends, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, companion and friend, invites us to this table of grace. He says, come to me, whether you are on the mountaintop of joy or in the valley of despair, come to me. Whether you are standing securely in the light of faith or mired in a cloud of doubt, come to me. Whether you are floating along the river of life or drowning at sea, come to me. Whether you are standing on holy ground or sinking into quicksand, come to me. In your extraordinary moments, in your ordinary moments, come to me. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome to this table to meet the risen Christ, to be nourished and transfigured by his grace. Come and partake in this meal of renewal and fellowship. We are invited to be strengthened and changed through the sacrament of communion. As this bread and cup are lifted and blessed, may we know that God lifts and blesses us. As these elements take on new meaning, may our lives be transformed as well. As we eat and drink, May we take into ourselves the light and love of Christ and become the presence of his grace here on earth. Let us pray. May the God of each mountain and valley be with you. And also with you. Children of God, lift up your hearts. We lift them to the one who raises us from despair to hope. We offer our praise to the one who calls us beloved. We give thanks to our God of love and light. You, eternal God, have given us life from the beginning of time. You spoke creation into existence, the majestic mountains, the courtly clouds, the rolling rivers, and the towering trees. You give us with this precious planet sustaining our bodies with the fruits and our clothes with the beauty of nature. You reveal yourself in the elements of creation, in the love of friends, family, and community, in your spirit dwelling deep within our hearts. You promise your presence with us always. Even when we have sinned against our neighbor and against you, you did not abandon us. Even when we have closed our hearts to your all-embracing love, you did not give up on us. You waited for us to return to you, sending us invitation after invitation through people of every age, but we continued to disobey. Because of your deep love for us, you sent your child, who could have remained seated in glory but chose instead to walk with us down this path called life. He could have remained on the mountaintop, but came down to minister to all in despair's empty valley. He could simply have told us how we should live, but instead demonstrated genuine love by being lifted on the cross and enfolding the world into his loving embrace transforming and renewing all of humankind. With those who have seen your glory, with those who hunger for your grace, we join in praising your name. Holy, holy, holy are you, God who offers love, light, and shelter. We join all creation in glorifying you. Hosanna in the highest. We join with all the prophets and saints. Blessed is the shining light, star of salvation, Hosanna in the highest. With grateful hearts, we remember how on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, 
gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, blessed it, poured it, gave it to his disciples, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, drink it in memory of me. O oh God, as we rejoice in your hearts, beloved, as we would listen to him with our souls, we speak of that transfiguring mystery called faith. Christ died, breaking sin's power forever. Christ was raised and his love conquered death. Christ will return to gather all the beloved to God. And we pray, overshadow us with your grace, God of light, as the Holy Spirit is poured on out upon us and the gift of this holy table. Transform these elements so that in our eating and drinking at this table, we might take in and be transfigured into the light of Christ for this world. We ask all this in the name of your child, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our, our Creator, who art, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forget those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So in just a moment, we invite you to come up to receive communion, coming up the center aisle, placing your offering gifts in the basket, receiving the bread by holding out your extended hands, and we will drop the bread into your thumb, and then stepping to receive a cup. You can deposit your cup in the basket to the side to my right and return to your seats. This morning we'll all be going down that aisle uh, just because of the, the bells tables here. In this congregation, as in all United Church of Christ, all who seek to know the love of God made known through Jesus the Christ are welcome to come and be fed. We use non-alcoholic juice in the cup, and there is gluten-free bread available if you need that. And if you are not able to come forward, please let the usher know, and we will come and serve you where you are. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are right. I now invite anyone on the Zoom to partake with their with your communion elements at your home. Let us pray together our prayer of thanksgiving. Having been fed with the bread of life, send us forth to be those hungering for compassion, kindness, and love. 
having been sated with the cup of salvation, send us forth to fill those thirsting for wholeness, for justice, for peace. May the light and hope of Jesus, who came down from the mountain to accompany us along our journeys, bring healing and hope to our broken world. Amen. Please rise for the closing hymn. sightings of God's grace and wisdom and presence. And may you take your mountaintop experiences to come down into the world to spread God's love and peace and joy and hope. And may the love of God and the peace of Christ and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.